Uh, I'm taking you back into Colossians again, message number seven out of the second chapter. And what I want to say before we get into this is I love the process of digging into each week, digging into this book. You know, if, if a person just kind of goes on autopilot, I think after the, these many years, it'd be very easy for me to just kind of press the autopilot and just keep going back to the things I've already said and done. But the wonder, the thing that makes me happy is I keep growing with you. That's important to me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be in a place where I feel like there's no more growth and there's no more areas to, to keep reaching and digging for. So, you know, I love the fact that, yes, God gave me a gift of natural linguist, and I love that I can go in and do translations, and that's a wonderful thing that I bring in, also the grammar. But the backdrop of this second chapter specifically is to point the Colossian folks to remembering Christ is sufficient in him. The verse we looked at, in him, you are complete. When we can go back in history and target specific things that were added on, it becomes a question for you, not for me. I'm not going to try and intrude in your personal life and tell you what to do. It simply becomes a question. Do you want to keep perpetuating? It's one thing to say, for example, I know why I celebrate a certain holiday, even though it's not necessarily a Christian holiday. I know why I do it, and I'm clear about it. I'm not confusing the lines. Therefore, I, I say to you, you know, whatever you're going to do, just understand and know why you're doing it. Now, I know that there were people, perhaps, that were angry. You know, I've laid things out. But it's up to us as individuals to do the work of digging and sometimes it's the unpleasant thing of finding out that the thing that you've been doing, practicing, celebrating, isn't really what you thought it was. And that's not to say abandon it. That's just to say recognize that it's not really truly a part of our faith. So this, this section really is doing that in a very deep way for me. Because, you know, I started looking at first the, we'll call them the Catholic traditions, and then I looked at the Protestant traditions, and we have this impossible situation. Every dimension of Christendom is indeed tainted by some way, shape, or form. And, you know, if you go back far enough, you've got a schism from the East and the West, those from the Greek Orthodox Church. I mean, it's probably impossible to clean up and I don't care whatever faction of Christianity you belong to, I think it's probably impossible to clean it up. So that's why I said to you, it's important to just read and study. Don't, and when I say read and study, I'm talking about those traditions. You find those in both the Catholic and Protestant historical chronicles. You find where these things have been added. And then recognize that maybe, maybe, it's time for us to look to reform ourselves and our faith. So these are the pitfalls, and this is why this, the backdrop of this is incredibly important. Complete in him, we don't need anything else. So verse 11 of the second chapter of the book of Colossians, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, I want you to notice something. This is one big, giant, run-on sentence, starting from verse 9, and it goes forward 9, 10, 11. But this particular verse, I want to look at for a reason. It, it will be, at least for me, I found the, the why of this verse pretty radical. So let me just kind of start... If you don't read Greek or you're not a Greek scholar, don't worry. I'm not asking you to learn Greek. You know, the minute I start doing this, some people start going a little nutty. That's okay. All right. So, this here, in 
in whom also you were circumcised. All right. This is a verb, indicative. There's a reason why I do grammar, so just bear with me. Aorist and passive. Why I'm pointing this out is the Greek is incredibly precise. And we're going to encounter three verbs in a sequence as we move forward that are in the aorist, which means it's something referring to an act done in the past. Aorist means it, it happened back there. And passive, it was performed on me. I, I stood still. Passive means I st- active. I'm doing it. Passive, I stood still. Something was performed on me. So when it says in whom also, the in whom is always referring back to in Christ, right? We've kind of been looking at the in whom, in him, with him. The driving force of this, where we're going, where Paul is taking the readers and he's taking us along with him, is reinforcing the union in Christ, with Christ. So when he says, in whom also... Now, I want you to watch something, and this is why I tell you grammar is important. See here, you are circumcised. And I'm translating this, you were. And actually, that's, you might think, well, what's the big difference? Well, there is a difference. You are is stating a present tense, but not referring necessarily to an act in the past. The aorist in the Greek does that, which tells you that this is an act that happened probably before I was even born or my name was spoken on this earth. Aorist that way. We're not talking about in my past, but past before my time. Understand? Okay. So, why? Somebody, woo! I know. Just bear with me. So, this is stating something that is much different than simply speaking about circumcision, but there's something here very important. It's, it says here, with the circumcision made without hands. So, let's keep going here and I'll show you something else. So, circumcision, writing in the Greek, you can see this word here, peritome is the Greek word for circumcision, not made with hands. So we have an A that puts it in the reverse. And the Greek word here, which kind of looks like a million dollar, lots of words here, lots of letters, but really what it is is this A puts in reverse, so without or putting, throwing it in reverse. And here we have, this is the word for hand and made. You see here, poeto, like we have to, the word to make, <clears throat> and hand. So, not made with hands. And uh, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So, first, this word, not made with hands. You're going to find this word repeated elsewhere. Do you remember when Jesus said, tear down this temple And in in speaking of the rebuilding, and he says, basically, and not made with hands, in that context, there are several passages in the New Testament that use this, this very same word, not made with hands, to say, and we can only go in one place, God's doing. Not made with human hands, done completely by God. So this word is saying something that carries the full meaning, something that only God can do, And equally interesting in this verse here is in putting off the body of sins. We have this word for putting off. I'll just write it out for you in case you're interested. And so this word here, epic duce, can be putting off, rolling back, cutting away, or of the stripping of a garment. So What's being communicated here, and this is important, by the circumcision of Christ, is something that Christ did to us in the framework of Paul trying to tell these people over here that these false teachers who have come, who were perhaps preaching, you need to be circumcised. Different than the problem of Galatia, 
They weren't trying to Judaize them, but they were saying, basically, probably, we have special knowledge you don't have, and potentially yielding yourself to being circumcised at this point will bring you into our special club of secret knowledge, so you'll have Christ plus whatever, whatever knowledge we have. That's Gnosticism. So Paul's driving force here is to say, you have been circumcised in the circumcision made without hands, something that only God can do that is an effective way of saying you have all that you need or Christ has been to you or done to you, that which these people were saying you need the outward mark for. Now, this outward mark instituted back in Genesis. And I want you to go there because I want to point something out that has just been a little bit enlightening overall, for me at least. If you go back into Genesis, and we know that, for example, oh, I'm going to be in Genesis 17, but we know in Genesis 12, basically God promises Abraham, or Abram, not yet Abraham, seed, that God would make a great nation basically come out of his loins. In Genesis 15, the promise is repeated for Abram to have a child and the promise of land. Genesis, Genesis 16 is where they come up with the idea because they've been essentially waiting all of these years for God to make good on this child that they're supposed to have. And they're supposed to have this child. God is going to say, Abraham and Sarai, the natural way, right? The regular way children are made, right? The way puppies are made. All right. <laughs> so they're tired of waiting. And as you know the story, Abraham takes matters into his own hands with Hagar. <laughs> Why, that's never going to come out good. I'm going to tell you this here. So if you're of, of a carnal mind, <laughs> this is not going to go very far. It's just going to all stay right there. But we see that Abraham and Hagar, which is Sarai, Abraham's wife's Egyptian handmaid, produce a child, Abraham and Hagar. This child is named Ishmael. This is not the promised child. But what's so fascinating about this, and I really find it incredibly fascinating, that the child is born, and some part of chapter 17, this is kind of a, an amazing thing. Typically, we know that later on in the institution of circumcision as a rite, God will say specifically the child is circumcised on the eighth day and so forth. The specifications become clear. But here, in Genesis 17, it says here, I'll read, and then I have to go back. So at 17 and verse 24 and 25, Abraham was 90 years, he was 99 when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Ouch. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. I want you to listen to this because this is, I started reading this and it dawned on me, you know, for every, every, every time God said this is a token or a sign and covenant is attached, God would always explain why. For example, when God caused the flood upon the earth, and then he said he would flood the earth no more after the waters abated. The rainbow becomes the sign of a covenant between God and the earth. Or when the instructions are given to the children of Israel to put the blood on the doorpost, that served as a sign for the death angel to pass over. Here there is actually, at this particular junction, no reason for the sign of circumcision being given. He, God just simply says this is a sign of our covenant, of the covenant between you and me. Now, well, I have to ask these questions because you know no one asks more questions than me. First of all, we cannot, we cannot say that the mark of circumcision was strictly something eventually that would only be associated with the children of Israel. 
Why? Because Ishmael, who becomes the line of Arabs, he's not part of the covenant promise, he was circumcised. So a lot of people think, well, the circumcision was done to identify God's people, but friend, that doesn't work unless you're walking around naked and showing everybody your stuff. That doesn't work. <laughs> so the sign of circumcision can only be one of two things. Can only be a sign for the person who's been circumcised to look upon their parts and see that is a reminder of the covenant. Or it could be on the part of God looking down at his creation. But I prefer that this was given as a sign for man to remember the covenant with God and the promise that God gave to Abraham of seed and of a progeny, if you want to say his descendants, a whole populace, a nation of people. So as I began looking at this, it, it dawned on me, the first thing is you go back and you start reading this 17th chapter. And I, I want to just cover this because I think this is an important point, beginning at the first verse of the 17th chapter of Genesis. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect or upright or sincere. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. Abraham fell on his face. God talked with him, saying, as for me, behold, and it's always my covenant, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Remember, his name now just means high father. His name will be changed to Abraham, father essentially of many peoples or nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful. Make, I will make nations of thee. Kings shall come out of thee. I will establish my covenant. It's always that. My covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Let me stop there for a second because he said basically an everlasting covenant. This I want to point something out to you. This is the same concept that we encounter when we talk about the tithe. This is, Genesis 17 is before any law of God is given. So things that God spoke of before the law, just like he spoke of the tithe, people don't want to recognize this, which was refined in the law, the, the covenant sign of circumcision was before the law. A lot of people get things confused. If God instituted something, before the law, and it is carried through in the law, then typically that's not to say that it, it will not be carried exactly the same after the law, but may still be implemented, but in instead of it being a type and a shadow, it becomes the actuality in the New Testament. So what we have here, it will be, you're, you're going to see, I'm going to make a connection to our text to explain why I would go back to show you this. There's something that something here in this covenant that God has said, I'm not done with my covenant, except the covenant of circumcision as an outward mark, as we know, moving into the New Testament, becomes an inward mark placed upon us by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And all of that becomes even more mind-boggling, but I'm jumping ahead, so let me, <laughs> let me stay here. That's my thing, is I, I want to race through here. Okay. And he says, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generation for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee and their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt you and me. A sign. This word in Hebrew is a sign. A sign of the covenant. So it, that little subtlety of the sign of the covenant is important when those things are included as a sign of the covenant you have to put a little mental note there to come back to that in a minute. He that is eight days old 
shall be circumcised among you, every man-child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy sea, which was commonplace to pick up and buy along the way, as Hagar was an Egyptian, they called her a maidservant, she was a slave. And this was very common in that day. So anyone that you picked up along the way, that you bought with money, that came under your roof, that you were then responsible for, these two. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So right away there, God just says one negative thing, refusal to do so, you're not, you're not one of my people, basically is what he's saying. God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her, her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. I will give thee a son also of her. And yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. Abraham fell on his face, laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? So again, reiterate in verse 19, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and his seed afterwards. Now, he says here very carefully, And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee, behold, I have blessed him, I will make him fruitful, he will, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. So the reason I point that out is because Ishmael was circumcised that did not make him a part of the covenant people. And this is a little subtlety you could just gloss right over because it would seem in this kind of legalistic understanding, as long as a person bore the mark, we could say they, were, they bore the sign of the covenant. But clearly right here, not Ishmael. And Ishmael, of course, as we know, is driven out and he's not a part of that promised seed. So when people talk about this into the New Testament, the terms of the circumcision and uncircumcision are referring to Jew and Gentile. And here we have this perfect scenario to show that just because one is circumcised, it does not mean that they are part of the covenant. Clear? Good. Okay. So if you move on, it says here, verse 21, which I just read, I will establish my covenant with Isaac. And then after that, um, it says, and he left talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Now, there's where we just read. And Abraham took Ishmael, his son, all that were born in his house, all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the, in the self same day as God had said unto him. Abraham was 99 when he circumcised, when he circumcised himself, essentially, and Ishmael was 13 years old, and so then we have here all the men of his house, born in the house, bought with the money of stranger. They were all circumcised that day. So we have the beginning of a, we'll call it, the carrying on of an everlasting sign of the covenant. But the, the reason why I went back to read this and make this kind of clear is people get confused about this. If we study circumcision in the ancient world, People were practicing circumcision before, during, and after this time when God prescribed it to his chosen people. So we can't make circumcision of, in and of itself. It's too generic. There were other people practicing that, not simply those who were listening to Jehovah. Now, you fast forward to Joshua. And in Joshua 5... We have another explanation of something regarding circumcision. Remember, Moses has died, and Joshua now is leading the children of Israel, or leading those that wandering band, but there's been several generations because the wanderings have been quite lengthy. It came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, 
heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until they were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives. And circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. That doesn't mean that the ones that had already been snipped are going to be re-snipped. <laughs> Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Remember, for all their murmurings, God basically strew their bones in the wilderness. Now, all the people that came out were circumcised, but, the, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them, they had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed, basically wiped out, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord swore unto their fathers he would give us, a land that floweth with milk and honey, and their children, whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole, until they were all healed up. And what's interesting is this verse 9, The Lord said unto Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. And that word for rolled away is the Hebrew word galal, which you can't see in the English, but it's a word play on Gilgal. So this day I have rolled away galal, the reproach of Egypt, wherefore the name of this place is called Gilgal. And if you look, if you have a Bible like mine in the margin, Gilgal is called rolling. Some have said the rolling back or the rolling away unto this day. Now, this marks, we'll call it a national identity of covenant, whereas the covenant that was instituted in Genesis 17, even though it, it, it's speaking of a national covenant in the sense of thy seed and the seeds that the, of the children yet to be born, but here is generation, a generation or two later. So what we have here is a national identity of circumcision. All the people then are circumcised. Now why is this important? Because remember I just read to you in Genesis 17, the man-child, and why on the eighth day? The eighth day is supposed to be eight, and if you look at the numbers, eight is supposed to be the number of new beginnings or of new life. So the, what happens here is you keep going and you eventually end up in the New Testament and you find something very interesting coming out of the individual probably the least likely to herald this this way. And hear me very carefully because a very subtle thing I'm going to say. It's the Apostle Paul who writes in Galatians 3.28, there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek. And elsewhere, I believe, in our letter of the Colossians, he'll say the same thing, but he'll say circumcised nor uncircumcised, all or one in Christ. And there's a reason why, because when God instituted this sign of the covenant, remember, it's a sign of the covenant. It's not a covenant in and of itself. It's a sign of the covenant. But not one person kept the covenant. To this day, people will argue and say, well, there are people who can keep the covenant. No. The law and its covenants, God basically made a, a, an impossible for fallible, messing up, erring man to possibly keep perfectly. The thing is, if you miss one part of the law, you miss it all. Miss just one little dot on an eye, you've missed it all. So why this is so mind-boggling is because you don't even get to the New Testament. You read in passages like Deuteronomy. There's a reference in Deuteronomy, I believe, 10, 20, and I, there's along the way several times where it says no longer, even though they're still circumcising the foreskin, but it says circumcise the foreskin of your heart. 
And these references that will crop up to internally taking what God basically meant as an outward sign, even in the Old Testament, many times over, circumcise, it, this is meant in a figurative way, the circumcision of the lips or of the heart or of the mind. Now, these obviously can't be circumcised the same way as circumcision takes place. So even back there in Deuteronomy, because it's where we start reading about circumcise the foreskin of your heart, and this concept will be carried through, is as if God is saying, right there in Deuteronomy, you've already missed what I've been trying to tell you. You've already missed that this sign of the covenant, you've already basically thrown it in the garbage. Because the covenant that I'm really looking for, if the covenant on the man was that every time a man looked at himself, he was reminded of the covenant, God is now saying, even there in Deuteronomy, the covenant I made with you is not just simply something of an exterior, but something that should penetrate deep. This is why this expression, circumcise the foreskin or the flesh of your heart. Commit yourself, the Bible says commit your way, commit yourself unto him. Now, the grievance in the Old Testament, many times over, God says, the people speak with their lips, but their heart is not close to me. And over and over again, when we, when we read these, we'll, we'll call them deeper meanings of circumcision, of the heart. God's saying, this is what, is, this is what matters to me. No outward marking is going to fix you. No, this is, oh, this is why I love this book, because it all, it, it all flows together. That's why Paul could say, I bear in my body the marks of a bond slave. I bear in my body the branding of my Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say, I'm branded on the outside, but he said, in the inside, in the inner man. Now, you take everything that I've said about circumcision, you might say, well, then why did Paul, who really, if you think about it, should have still been heralding circumcision, he's of the circumcision, why does he bring forth now, go back to our text, why does he bring forth this very strange, and it is, if you think about it, to, to, to have this appear in a New Testament text, it's not, it's not impossible. There are references to circumcision in Romans 2, and there are references to circumcision elsewhere, but in this context, circumcision, the next verse is buried with him in baptism, raised with him from the dead. It's such a weird occurrence that we have to look at the deeper meaning that's there. And the deeper meaning, when he says, in whom also ye were circumcised, something done to you in the past, is speaking about something, obviously, that Christ did in dying on the cross that makes the inward person and no longer simply, I want you to think about this, if circumcision was remained as the sign of the covenant, it means that in the new dis dispensation, God didn't make provisions for the rest of his creation. And this is why it says in Christ, you're all one in Christ, because what the law could not do and distinguished between certain things that now with the law, when it says when Christ was crucified, the temple veil was rent in two. Basically, if you want, ripping down, tearing apart the law and all of its binding heavy load, impossible to keep, and a new way that is basically what came out of that, a new dimension, if you will, in Christ, which then he performs that work on the inner person, which no outer cuttings, no outer markings could ever accomplish. So when Paul says, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, he is not saying anything else than to you Colossians who are being essentially led astray. You don't need to do that. If you remember back in Acts 15, they had a big council meeting and they all got together and they decided that the Gentiles should not be circumcised. That if somebody wanted to be, that was one thing, but they were not going to impose or force that. So it becomes clear to me that Paul is saying essentially, 
this is very much like what we read in Galatians, stand fast with the liberty where you have been set free. Don't let anybody take you back into bondage. We start off, most of us, with a checkbox mentality when it comes to our faith, when it comes to religion, when it comes to spirituality. We've got a checkbox. But what happens when you take that checkbox away and you say, Christ did it all? Not only that, but the thing that we want to keep imposing on you, this, obviously, these people were trying to lead the folks at Colossae to say, most likely, this is something you should consider doing. Now, you know, listen, here's the problem. When God instituted this sign of the covenant, it probably had the greatest value to the individual receiving it as they understood it. But as time goes on, you have people today now who, I believe in the health benefits, I'm, I'm speaking now, opinion, okay? I believe in the health benefits of circumcision, but you've got people who will wholeheartedly claim in a certain religious realm they are circumcising their child for religious purposes, but then the child is not raised within the realm of any religious understanding. I see this very often. I see this specifically with a lot of my Jewish friends. And that is to say, this is why this becomes important. I've said this before. It was said from somebody else way before me. If you're going to be a Christian, be one. If you're going to be a Christian, know why you're a Christian. Know what you believe and why you believe. The same thing is true of any other faith. Know why you believe what you believe and then believe it. Walk in it. But here's the problem with this. Once it became simply an outward symbol, it almost became like this is a mark in our modern culture. Now, I'm not talking about Orthodox Jewry. They still adhere very, very tightly to these standards. But we're talking more about the average flow, how people view this thing. It's more of a mark now, and it does not even symbolize the sign of the covenant anymore. Why? Because if it did symbolize the sign of the covenant for the individuals receiving it, and let's talk more in Judaism than anything else, then it wouldn't just be that the child receives the mark. Okay, we have certain other traditions that are kept up, but then, okay, the child has their bar mitzvah at, I don't know, is it 12 or 13, and then that's that. Once you've read from the Torah, done your 2, 4, and 6, and maybe you'll grow up and you'll marry a good Jewish boy or girl, and it's all good, but what does that make for the covenant part of it if you are not covenanting with God? And I don't care if you're a Jew or a Christian, whatever you are. In other words, if you're just going through the motions, I'd say to you, you better check yourself. Because if all of this is real, and I believe that it is, then we're going to have a lot of people surprised that they went through the motions of things, thinking that they were actually connected when in fact all they did, again, it's, forgive me for making this as a comparison, but it'll be analogous to those people that simply view the church as a, you know, I go there once a year, or it's an entertainment place, or it's a good place to drop my kids off. Nothing more, nothing less. So what's important in this verse, then, is this. Let me get down to the last part of the verse, just to show you one thing, and then we'll be done with translation. Peritome. Tu Christu. Tu Christu. Okay. So, in the circumcision of Christ. Now, here's why I wanted to do this, to show you something very interesting. This of Christ, without getting into heavy grammar, is in the genitive, something that either comes from him, is of him. So we're not... Just to be sure, we're not talking about the circumcision of anyone else or anything else. We're not talking about the circumcision of the Old Testament. We're not talking about the circumcision of these folks over here, but something that Christ does to the inner man. Now think about this. The the word that I showed you about putting off, if indeed it is the stripping off of the flesh, there are two camps of interpretation that I, quite frankly, I will tell you what camp I'm in, but I'll give you the two camps of interpretation. In the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh, 
by the circumcision of Christ because this is in the genitive, which could be objective genitive, could mean that Christ himself, in basically in the stripping of his flesh, speaking of his crucifixion, that act then becomes the circumcision of Christ, or rather what Christ has done in the capacity to us, which this is the way I'm applying it, because that's the way I believe Paul meant it, what is done to us in the inner man, which is analogous to when Paul says, putting off the old man or putting off the flesh. This is analogous to that. It's as if to say that the act that Christ did there in the past, that he worked on me, accomplished that. And this is why later on Paul says things like, walk ye in him. He already did it, so he's already kind of cleared the path for you. That doesn't mean it's autopilot. You still have to walk there in faith. But what I love about this text is something clicked while I was studying this, and it dawned on me. If we could take all of the traditions, all of the stuff we think matters, and recognize just this one verse here alone that says, the, the, the act that Christ has done inside me should be a clear clarion call to anyone who thinks there's something you need to do that if something has been done to you, worked on you, operated on you through and by God, it means why would you want to add to that glorious act which he started, which he promises to finish? Why would you even want to tamper with that? I want to walk in it. I want to, I want to revel in the fact that he's doing something on me, to me. But in this case, he's already done something in me. So for Paul telling these people, you are complete in him, he's trying to say you don't need any of these exteriors. Well, that's just too easy. You know, I have to be able to, to do something. I have to be able to have something that I can say, I did this thing. And God says, no, that's not the way it's going to work. Now, I'm not going to tell you that, that this section here is completely easy. Why? Because we have here this verse we just touched on. We'll go to, and we'll see another aorist, by the way, buried with him and raised with him. This triad of aorus tell me of what he has already done for me. This is what's frustrating. A lot of times I think people ask, well, what's God going to do for me? No. What has God already done for you? What has he already completed? Who could read this and interpret anything else except that something has been done to me, for me, to you, for you? And if that's not enough, you keep looking at this, that putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision. In other words, it's almost like saying something that has been done, whether it is to aid, to facilitate, to help, to remind, but it is its own covenant of the New Testament because Christ said, for this cause he came. How can we have Christianity that has become Christless? How can we have Christianity without talking about the power of God through the word, through the spirit, the power of salvation that comes? How, how does any of this apply in today's society when people are so busy saying, well, but, but you have to do something else. There's got to be something more to this. Now, I've told you in times past, it's very easy to get caught up into the trap of what you all need to do or how you need to do something more. But this verse makes it abundantly clear. And in fact, if I go back and reread just that section where it says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, then I ask you again, tradition of men could be the things that we know, we looked at, that have been added on, but the tradition of men can also become the things that we do by rote without even acknowledging or asking why. And the driving forces, he was trying to say, you don't need these other things. How many times will he repeat this? Because take a look, if you keep reading, verse 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, 
and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. You don't need that anymore. You don't need that anymore. You don't need this anymore. Well, don't you do good works? Don't you get out and do this? Don't you do this? Did I just not read to you what basically was abolished when Christ died on the cross? Yet there'll be people who, again, I've said this for the last couple of weeks, it's very blurry, not quite clear what belongs and what doesn't. What is the new di dispensation? What is the new testament decree versus people taking from the old and drying it in and saying, see, now, there are elements that you can't just gloss over. I've said many times, Jesus raised the bar. He didn't destroy, he raised the bar. Remember when they came to him and he says, you've heard it said unto you, thou shalt not kill. But he says, behold, I say, if you hate in your heart, you're as guilty as a murder. He raised the bar. If the bar was simply thou shalt not kill, you might be able to say, well, I haven't killed anybody. But Jesus said, no, not did you do the act? Did you think the thought? Because if you think the thought, you're as guilty as committing the act. Okay. So don't think it's all like, oh, it's all gone away. He raised the bar. But in these concepts of legalistic behavior that kept getting grafted and pushed back on. If you look at church history, and in fact, if you look at many of the church traditions that I've touched on, you're going to find something. A lot of, there are a lot of carryover rituals that actually got engrafted onto the church from Judaism. And even there, people haven't even separated that. I'm not against looking back and peeling back to find out why we celebrate certain things, why we do certain things. For example, how you see in certain, specifically Greek Orthodox or Catholic, censors still being used. That's not, any, you might say, well, that's out of, straight out of paganism. Well, actually, that came out of Judaism. Now, whether they grafted it from paganism or Judaism, who's to say? Depends on what history book you're reading. My point is, this, these are the questions that should be asked. Not, let's do away with everything, but let's ask the questions. Where did they come from? Why are we doing this? And this particular thing where he's referencing circumcision, he's not saying now, okay, you all need to line up and conform. He's saying, you've already been conformed. Christ has conformed you. There's no more outer markings. There's no more of this. It's been done away with. Keep reading with me because he says to me, let no man therefore judge you in meat, in drink, or in respect of a holiday, or new moon, or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body, the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Keep reading. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments, that is the same word we encountered in verse 8, rudiments of the world, the rudiments of the world. Why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish, with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. So it's still being, the question is still being asked to the Apostle Paul. Does Christ not set you free? So why are you still doing or being influenced or thinking to do, to add on, to tack on? Why? And this, this whole section is designed, for, first and foremost, to the Colossians to get their attention back. Why are you doing this? If Christ, if you are complete in him, and if in him all the fullness of the deity dwells, and you have been essentially circumcised in the inner person by that complete pleroma of God, why would you look to add anything else? Why would you want to do anything else? to frustrate what God has already started, what he's already working on, and what he's going to finish. No, it's too irresistible. I, I have to do something. I, can't, I just can't let it be that God's going to do it all for me because there's got to be something more. I told you, that was my mindset. Got to be something more. And much like, I will say, much like 
when Martin Luther read that scripture, the just shall live by faith, there was a turning point for me. My turning point may be not as important or as radical as a Martin Luther or a reformer, but my turning point was a recognition. Mine was more of if Christ did come out of the grave, and I never doubted it, but if he did come out of the grave, then man, oh man, I am, I'm on the right course because if he did, then I'm with him. I'm, I'm with him, right? <laughs> so all I'm saying to you to bring this kind of to a close is as I, as I dig into some of these maybe concepts that I probably wouldn't have really looked at as closely as I have in studying and preparing these messages, it, it, it reassures, it reaffirms the things that I've been saying now for 16, almost 17 years. Just like what Paul says to the Romans, the just shall live by faith, from faith to faith. It's all of faith. There is no such thing. And I believe this wholeheartedly. If one is reading this book to glean anywhere, that God says, now, you receive my grace because it's a free gift, but I also want you to do these other things. And these are the other things I want you to do. I want you to read off of cards. I want you to read off of beads. I want you to do these repetitions. I want you... It, it's not happening. It's not even there. And there's where I actually put a pause button. And I want you to try and do the same thing that I did. I tried to put myself... I know it sounds a little blasphemous, so don't, don't judge me. That I want you to try and put yourself... For just a few seconds, imagine that you have, I don't want to say you're God, but you have the bird's eye view of God. Maybe, maybe you're at God's side looking down at all of creation, hearing God say, this is what I want of you. I want you simply just to trust me. That's the easiest thing in the world. But the rest of the creation, as maybe you have the opportunity to look down with God, the rest of the creation is saying, we have to do something. We got to keep doing something. We're doing stuff. We're, we're working. We're fixing. We're... If you were the one graciously bestowing your gifts upon these people, how would you react in seeing the refusal to just simply do? In other words, the simplicity of what he asks of us, and yet we don't do it the simplicity just to trust him, just to take him at his word, just to faith in him. We have to keep adding. We have to keep building. How it must grieve God that we just can't follow a simple instruction, just so simple that it maybe is too simple for us. But I'm asking you just to consider for a second from God's perspective, looking down at his creation, how he must view us as we are constantly thwarting and basically throwing away his gift of grace, because we have to improve. We, we have to do something. Instead of just saying, like these many that followed him, or the few that followed him, that probably felt completely unworthy, unsure, but nevertheless, when he said, follow me, I'll make you something you're not, they did. My guess is God is still calling people today and saying the same thing, follow me, and I'll make you something you're not. But that requires that you take the first step. That's not you make a decision. The first step is you decide you're going to follow Christ. And I've said many times, I'm following Christ. If you want to follow me as I follow Christ, but the idea there is I haven't set out to build my own temple or to build my own whatever. I've set out, I've set on a course. Maybe my course for the next part of my ministry will be to try and get people to understand we need to go back to the center of things that I spoke of at the beginning to reform, to get back to where we were a people who actually understood that God doesn't desire that we should do all of these jumping through hurdles and creating towers of Babel and doing things that he doesn't want, but the very simple thing that he desires that we're able to do, which is just take him at his word and trust him. And for that... He does perform something and has inside of us that is the stripping away. It is the beginning, if you will. This is why when the book of Ephesians says we are his workmanship, he's doing something on me and on you, through you, that is his transformative process. I don't want to mess that up. 
trust me, I spent the first 25 years messing it up. I don't want to be interfering. Now, I'm not a person who, you know, I know a lot of people like that hippie statement, let go and let God. I do believe, though, you act and live by faith, trusting him, taking him at his word. If he said he's able to do something on the inside, no outward marks are required, no extra works, no flesh activity, then I will take him at his word and I will stand on that word knowing that whatever he does, he does perfectly. I'm not perfect. I'm kind of messed up, but what he does, he does perfectly. And he's promised to bring me into his beloved care. He's promised to take me unto him in the now and eternally. Forgiven, washed, cleansed, loved. What more could you ask for? So I'm not going to frustrate the grace of God. I pray you don't either. Even though this is very simple, the repetition is required until we come to a place of saying, this is what Christianity requires, faith, and the just shall live by faith. It's not works. We are not saved by works. We're saved through and by grace, through faith. That is Ephesians. That is Galatians. That is Colossians. That's the whole book that says, stand on that. God sees your heart, knows what operation he's already done and is continuing to do, and he is the great physician. So his surgery what he does on the inside, equally he does perfectly to bring you to that wholeness, the peace of God that passes all understanding. And I'm praying for those people who are constantly fighting and warring more baggage, more works, more flesh, more this, to be delivered from that, because it is true, whom the Son sets free is free indeed, and I can say it for me, he set me free. Thank God. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.